in the springtime. Why does it feel so good to walk along the beach and put your toes in the seawater? What's going on there? And what's going on there is something very important for your health and for your happiness, your longevity, really your longevity. I want you all to have from energy medicine the secrets to a long, happy, healthy life. And connecting with the earth is extremely important because the earth is a source of the best antioxidant in the universe, electrons. The electrons come from the sun, they come to the earth when lightning strikes, and the electrons are conducted over the surface of the earth everywhere because the earth's surface is a good electrical conductor. And when you put your bare feet on the earth, electrons come in to the point at the ball of the foot called kidney one, known to therapists of all kinds for a long time. The beginning point of the acupuncture meridian system, the electrons come up through the meridians and flood into every nook and cranny of your body. You need those electrons. Their purpose is to prevent damage to healthy tissue if you have an injury. Should you have an injury, the body is ready. If, you're, if you've been grounded, and a lot of people never touch the earth, they don't come in contact with the earth day in, day out, year after year, and they are what I call electron deficient. The body has a tissue the connective tissue, the ground substance that is everywhere that soaks up electrons and stores them and keeps them there in case you have an accident. If you have an accident or an injury or a cut of any kind, the immune system sends white blood cells to the area. They secrete free radicals. The FDA doesn't like free radicals. Technically, we call them reactive oxygen species. And these are like Pac-Man, chomp, chomp, chomp. Their goal, their purpose, is to chew up any bacteria or dirt or pathogens that might have entered your skin and to clear out any cellular debris, any cells that have been damaged so that your tissue can be repaired. Very important. So the electrons from the earth protect the area surrounding an injury, protect from the free radicals. Without grounding, the free radicals leak into healthy tissue and they create inflammation. Inflammation is the start of all disease, all of the chronic diseases. This has been major research for the last 20 years, major research in labs all over the world showing that every chronic disease begins with an inflammation. And you've got that story already. So inflammation has five hallmarks, the pillars of inflammation, well known in medicine since the Greeks. Pain, red, redness, soreness, heat, loss of function. Five pillars of inflammation You'll find them in medical textbooks. They are an artifact. They don't have to happen. Animals that are injured in nature put the injured part down to the earth. They instinctively know what to do. We don't. We wear shoes that have insulating soles. That is a disaster. The health of America has gone steadily downhill since the 1950s when we started making shoes out of plastic and rubber. It used to be we had shoes made of leather. Leather is conductive. When you walk on the earth with leather soled shoes or flip-flops or whatever, you are getting electrons, nourishing electrons from the earth. You will have more energy if you are in contact with the earth. Why? because our energy comes from our mitochondria, which do a thing called the electron transport chain to produce 
Adenosine triphosphate, it's the energy molecule that makes everything run, it makes muscles contract, nerve conduct. It does it, anything that happens in your body is powered by ATP, and it, it's formed from the flow of electrons, energetic electrons, through the electron transport chain. If you're feeling tired, if you're feeling sick, if you're feeling bloated, like you ate too much, Thanksgiving, too much turkey, um, asthma, any kind of inflammatory condition, take your shoes and socks off, go sit outside or stand and walk in the grass in your bare feet. It does wonders for you. Try it out. You'll be amazed at what happens. If you, if you or any of your friends have a cardiovascular issue, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the world and it's easily remedied by going barefoot. It's free. Going barefoot is cheap, easy, and very effective. How does that work? It works because electrons from the earth enter your circulatory system. The electrons coming through your bare feet go everywhere in your body. And red blood cells become coated with the electrons and they electrostatically repel each other. It thins your blood. Every kind of cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, peripheral vascular conditions, uh, enlargement of the heart, right vent ventricular hypertrophy is the fancy word for it. All these conditions, all the cardiovascular conditions are caused by the blood being too thick. It's viscous. It's like ketchup. If you go in your bare feet, the electrons thin your blood and handle all those conditions. People who have arrhythmias are astounded with how the arrhythmias disappear if they become grounded. I uh, am supposed to have prostate cancer, although I don't think I do. I think it's a uh, figment of the uh, hospital industrial complex, which has created all kinds of reasons to suck you into the hospital for expensive procedures. If you have cancer and you have pain, get a patch. These are like electrode patches they use, they put on your chest when you get a, an electrocardiogram. You can put it where the pain is. You can run the wire to a rod in the ground, or you can plug it into the third prong on your electrical outlet, the one right there. Put the patch on the place that hurts, You'll be amazed. And in fact, our research has shown that tumors will not grow if you're grounded. They won't grow. Cancer is an inflammation. This has been known for a long time. We actually, part of our process of studying, my process of studying alternative medicine is to understand the reality of life, the reality of the human body. And there are a lot of things that are in medical textbooks that are just plain wrong. Sorry about that. The doctors learn things that just aren't true. If you're a physician, I'm not insulting you, I'm just telling you the facts of life, that doctors do not, for example, learn physics in medical school. There's no physics in medical school. None. So when you talk to them about energy medicine, what is energy? And if you talk to them about Reiki and how maybe out of your hands, if you're a Reiki practitioner and you've learned the procedures, energy comes out of your hand in the form of lots of things. The hands produce magnetic fields. You don't have to touch the body to interact. You can 
measurements done at uh, the Institute for Heart Math show that from 18 inches away, your heart rhythms start to register in the brain waves of your patient. 18 inches away, you don't have to touch. And it turns out, if, if you ask somebody who's serious about this, they will say, well, that's too weak to have any effect. It turns out that it isn't. The amount of energy coming from 18 inches away is just right to affect the cells in a person you're working with. So Reiki, hands-off therapies of all kinds, they work. One of the really interesting things about the hands is that the fingernails give off light. And these are measurements that have been done especially by a very sophisticated group in Holland. The von Weichs have mapped the light coming out of the body. And light comes out from three main places. The third eye gives off a lot of light, the heart gives off a lot of light, and the hands give off a lot of light. One of the interesting things about the fingernails is they're crystals. If you look up fingernail structure in whatever Google or anywhere you want to look, you will see that the fingernails are made of keratin crystals. Keratin is the material that is in your hair, in the surface of your skin, and very highly organized in your fingernails. Well, isn't that nice that you have light coming out of your fingertips, out of your fingernails? Why is that important? because light is involved in physiology. I just wrote a review, and I'm going to be talking at the International Light Association conference in Oslo, Norway in a couple of weeks. Um, light has to be important in regulating how cells talk to each other. There is a phenomenon, and I, I I wrote a book about this because I watched a, an ice skater in the Olympics. Her name was Midori Ito. She was fantastic. And she was totally relaxed. This was the gold medal competition. People are nervous. They work their whole lives to, for this instant to go out there and do figure skating. They've worked their whole lives to get to that point. They tend to be nervous. Midori Ito was completely relaxed. Her performance was perfect. In fact, it was more, and I get emotional when I think about it, it was more than perfect. It was emotional. It was, it just, it just was incredible. It just had an emotional effect on me. It was so powerful. I had to write a book about it. I had to find out what is that. And athletes and dancers and other performers have a story that they can get into the zone. And the zone is a state of consciousness in which your performance is perfect. Hockey players do it. Not all the time. And if you think, great, I'm in the zone, guess what? You're out of the zone. <laughs> so it's a state of consciousness where the mind is empty and your body does what it needs to do to carry out whatever it is you're trying to do. And in the process of writing that book, therapists have the same experience. Sometimes when therapists are working on somebody, it's like the walls disappear, the connection is totally open, everything is quiet, and they feel a real sense of connection with the person they're working on, and miracles happen. Not all the time, sometimes. It's a fantastic state, and to understand that, I came up with a concept of systemic cooperation, in which every cell and every molecule in your body 
is involved in whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So Midori Ito was totally connected to herself. Every, every molecule, every atom in her body was participating in her triple axle, the first time that a woman did a triple axle in the Olympics. She did it. Took my breath away. So that's something that can happen. And how does that happen? We have a model of communication in the body that's based on molecular communication. Molecules, signal molecules. A signal molecule is secreted by a cell and then it diffuses randomly, staggers, I call it the drunken sailor model of regulation, it staggers until it bumps into a receptor and turns on a cell a distance away. I just wrote a review about, an article about that, and I said, if that's the way our ancestors responded when they were threatened by a predator, our ancestors would have been eaten. They'd be gone. We wouldn't be here. Why would nature pick such a slow, random process as diffusion to regulate things when it had available to it all of the tricks of nature, all the physical tricks like light? Light travels at the speed of light. So it looks like, and the evidence is growing, and I just met some of the scientists working on this in Heidelberg last week. Um, nature uses light. It's a whole new field of medicine. Unfortunately, none of the research is being done in the United States. None. We don't do that. If you're a, a researcher in a medical school and you go to the dean and say, I want to apply for a grant to study light, the physiology of light, the dean will say, that's fine, you can do that, you can't do that here. We don't do that here. We don't study energy in the medical school. We don't study energy. Holy mackerel. Energy has been left out of our medicine. It's just, it actually comes down to um, competition for dollars. And the problem with light is that it's not a pharmaceutical, <laughs> and it's free, and it doesn't have side effects, and it's very powerful. The FDA hates light. If you do light therapy, you can get in trouble pretty quick. So that's a big thing that's missing from our medicine. There are lots of things that are missing from our medicine. I wrote a book on energy medicine. I was told you can't write a book on energy medicine. Well, tell me you can't do something and that's what I'm going to do next. <laughs> I'm always inspired when somebody says I can't do something. Not only did I do it, but the book was a big success and it's been sold all over the world and I have been invited to give talks all over the world. I've talked in... First edition, second edition. I've lectured in about 26 countries. I get to see the world because I wrote this book that you can't write. <laughs> so do the things that you can't do. The procedure that we went through, the, my work has led me to the heart. And my next article will be the heart of space, I think. I think all things connect through the heart. All things connect through all parts of our body. You, you could single out your ear or your fingertip. You could single out any part of your body and tell a story of how it's connected to things. John Muir said, if you look closely at a blade of grass, you will see it's hooked to everything else. And that's the way it is. And this is the com coming realization. 
as you pointed out, that people are going to wake up to the fact that we're all part of each other. No man is an island. And that is a way of life. That's Once you realize that, it changes everything. And it will change the world for people to realize that. And this level of consciousness is coming quickly. Maybe, as Fritoff Kopper said in his book, The Turning Point, maybe the turning point has been passed. Maybe we're there already. So the heart, one of the, I began my investigations of energy medicine around 1980. I'm very old. I'm uh, 96, no, eight, I'm old, I'm 79, I'm 79. <laughs> Not forgotten. <laughs> I was born in 1939, I'm well preserved, and the way I'm real, well preserved is I'm happy. I highly recommend happiness. <laughs> and one way of getting happy, one way of navigating the world where upsets happen or you don't know what to do, remember the heart hum. Mm -hmm. Remember that. If you're in an argument with somebody and they're about to punch you in the nose, sneak in a little heart hum. <laughs> they won't notice. A little quiet heart hum. And you will be surprised at what happens next. Check it out. Try it. I tell therapists, if you're stumped with your client and you don't know what to do next, do a little heart home, and your heart will tell you. The heart is plugged in to the wisdom of the universe. And I can prove it, and I will, in a minute. I have a friend who's an acupuncturist in uh, Britain. I told her, when you put the needles in, Hold your fingers over the needles without touching and do a heart home. See what happens. She was astounded at what happens. You don't have to touch the needle. The energy goes from your fingers through the needle, through the meridian, it circulates, and you can produce a huge effect. And what are you doing when you do that? You're opening up communication. All disorders happen when a part of the body is not getting the messages that it needs to sustain itself. So circuitry, the body's circuitry, opening up the circuitry so that energy and information can flow. My knee hurts because it's not getting information. Something is, there's a blockage somewhere. That's what acupuncture is about. That's the theory. So this is forcing energy through the circuit. Not always the best thing to do to put more energy through a circuit. Sometimes the circuits are too energized. and You need to, they call it tonify. You have to calm down the energy. So these are different tricks you can do, and the heart hum can help you out. So in 1980, <clears throat> I began my study of energy medicine. I gave myself a sabbatical. I had uh, worked hard at the university, and I had um, saved some money. And so I took a couple of years to live in the library at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, one of the best libraries in the world. And I have worked in some libraries that were horrible. Like some libraries are designed to keep you away from the books, <laughs> to prevent you from finding out anything. Like the University of Copenhagen had a giant library, and when they got a new journal, they would, you could take it away. And people took journals away and kept them for months. 
So if you wanted to see the latest research, you'd have to wait for months until they brought it back. Hey, that was crazy. Anyway, at the Marine Biological Laboratory, the library is organized alphabetically. The A journals are in the top floor, the Z journals are at the bottom floor. You can run up and down the stairs. You can find any scientific article you want in a matter of a minute or two. You can read a scientific paper that has 30 references. You can run up and down the stairs and pretty soon you have a stack of journals which are have the 30 articles that were cited here. So you can find out if what this guy says about what these articles say was right. It's because people make mistakes. They say such and such and they cite so and so and if you look at so and so, he didn't say that. He didn't say it at all. So that's, that's what it takes to be a scholar, to find out really what's going on. So I was working in the, in the library, I was looking up things. I wanted to find out what doctors thought about energy, what the medical profession thought about energy. And I finally, after years of work, I found out they don't think about energy. <laughs> so I was looking for something that didn't exist. I also wondered why the hush-hush? Why, why, why be quiet about something that is basic to our very existence? Every moment of your life, you are analyzing your energetic environment. You're seeing with your eyes. Light is a, is a form of energy. You hear with your ears. Sound is a form of energy. You taste, you smell, you feel. You feel things. Feeling, touch, is energetic. You can tell that this is a sort of linoleum type surface because of the way it, your fingers vibrate when you move over. When you feel wood, it feels different. That's frequency. It's the frequency that your fingertips pick up when you feel different things. So we're all experts on energy. We do it all the time. Why the big mystery? Every type of medical intervention is energetic in one way or another. Even surgery <clears throat> is energetic. How does a knife cut through tissue? That's a profound question. What does it mean to be sharp and cut through tissue? All of it's energetic. So I was looking for information on energy and things that might relate to alternative medicine. And Buckminster Fuller had a statement. He said, when you're working on something important, the universe will provide what you need, the tools that you need. And I had experiences where I'd be walking along the bookshelves and a book would fall off the shelf onto the floor and it would open up and I'd look at it and I'd go, oh my God. And often it was something I wasn't looking for, but something I needed to know, but didn't know that I needed to know. It was incredible. My whole life has been a blessing. So one of the things that happened was I was reading Gray's Anatomy. You can't read Gray's Anatomy. It's this thick. It weighs 10 pounds. It's a huge reference book. But I was reading the section on the heart, and there was an article that they cited called The Electric Circulation. I was looking for how energy moves through the body. That fit the bill. The electric circulation. What is that? And it was by a scientist from Spain. And I went to the library, and they, they, had, they have a, an interlibrary loan librarian, a librarian who specializes on getting obscure articles for you. Scholars need stuff like that. I asked the interlibrary loan librarian to get me that article on the electric circulation. A month later, she came back and said, there's no copy of that article anywhere in the United States. Mm -hmm. Definitively, she checked everywhere. 
not even in the Library of Congress, which has just about everything. She said, I suggest you write to the editors of Gray's Anatomy and ask them if they know anything about it. So I wrote to Peter Warwick in London and asked him about this article. And he said the article was, he, he sent me one of these, you know those blue, thin, flimsy airmail envelopes. Yeah. He sent me a letter typed out on one of those. He said that article by Francisco Torrent Wasp, um, here's Dr. Wasp's address. He lives in Dina, Spain, Alicante, and write to him. He'll be glad to hear from you. So I wrote to him, and I got back a pile <laughs> of articles. And the electric circulation, he wrote in big letters, thank you, Dr. Oshman, for your interest in my work. And it turns out, at the time, he had made a major discovery about the heart, and his colleagues, his, his cardiology co uh, colleagues, thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. In fact, I really pay, pay total close attention to the scientists who are considered crazy, <laughs> because usually their ideas are really important. It's always seemed to work for me. So. Dr. Guasp had made a major discovery about the heart. It took him 50 years. He found out the structure of the ventricles. And the ventricles had been a mystery in anatomy. The greatest anatomists of all time had given up. Vesalius and de Blonville and others had struggled. They called it a Gordian knot. A Gordian knot is a knot that is so tangled, nobody can untie it. The ventricles were difficult. And you can watch on YouTube, you can watch Dr. Guasp unraveling the ventricles. And he takes a cow heart, he boils the, car, car, the uh, cow heart to loosen up the connective tissue, and then wearing gloves with his bare hands, he unravels the ventricles, and he discovered that the ventricles were made of a single band of muscle. There it is, a single band of muscle, okay. which wraps up in the intact heart into a double helix. Wow. 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 about that? Awesome. So the electricity in the heart is going through a double helix, which resonates with the other double helix that you have thousands of, of in every cell in your body, the DNA. They resonate. They don't have to be the same size. They have to have the same geometry. Structures with similar geometry will resonate. Tuning fork effect. Take one tuning fork at A sharp, bang it, it vibrates. Another tuning fork a distance away will vibrate. The vibrations are conducted through the air. You do the same thing with radio. Send frequencies through an antenna. A similar antenna a distance away will resonate. That's how radio works. It's called the tuning fork effect. Very, very effective. So Dr. Guasp showed single band of muscle, and a couple of years later, he sent this model to me. Uh, it was made as a giveaway to doctors by one of the drug companies. And I carried this around, and I demonstrated it to people. And somebody once came up and grabbed a hold of it and pulled a little too hard, and it broke. And I had a broken heart. <laughs> and I discovered I could fix it with super glue. So if you have a broken heart, it can be fixed with super glue. <laughs> and that sounds funny, but I think there may be some practical value to that, because the place that breaks is a very interesting spot. It turns the heart into a single, a single surface 
which is called a Mobius strip. You can make one out of a sheet of paper if you just, a strip of paper, you just uh, twist it and glue the ends together. It has one surface. M.C. Escher made a, a painting of a Mobius strip, and I, I can show you, I have a slide of it, um, with ants walking along the surface. <laughs> and it's, one, it's got one surface. That turns out to be a very interesting structure in terms of space and time. It plugs right into the geometry of space time. That takes a bit of digesting. I've been trying to figure out what that's all about. And given a couple, three hours, maybe I could get into detail. <laughs> It's been demonstrated again and again that some people are clairvoyant. They know what's going to happen next, especially women. Not every woman, but some, some women are very astute at what's going to happen next. And a study was done at HeartMath by Roland McCready and colleagues, and he said the mind scans a few seconds into the future. What an amazing statement. And then they did some studies that showed that this is true. And the way they did it was subjects looked at a computer screen. There was a 10 second delay while the computer made up its mind whether it would randomly present an emotional scene or a peaceful scene. And then shut off, shut down for 10 seconds. During all of this, the, emotion, the heart rate dropped before the person could see the emotional scene. Some other scientists discovered, watched the dilation of the pupil, the eye. And the pupil dilates before you see something. It kind of knows what's coming. This is very important in saving your life. This is, this is the thing that happens when you go to step off the curb and, and something says wait and then the bus goes by and it would have squished you. It has very practical value. <laughs> Some scientists from Australia discovered some, did some experiments with photons. The, the photon, the, the, the photon was, its activity depended on something that hadn't happened yet. I have collected a bunch of articles like this. This seems to be a real thing, a real phenomenon. It appears that the heart in the McCready studies, heart math, the heart picks up this, what's happening in the future before the brain. The heart is the sensor. So the heart, something's going on there. And next week, no, next, I guess on Thursday, when I give the keynote at the uh, Energy Psychology Conference, I'm going to ask them to think about that little place in the heart that seems to be very vulnerable to breaking. I'm going to ask them to see if they can contact that area in a person who's undergone a heartbreaking experience. Mm -hmm. Those experiences happen to people, we've all had them at one time or another. They can cause huge depression. Can you reach that area and mend it? And one of the things I've learned from energy medicine is that if you can find a part of the body that needs attention, it changes. It changes. Right? 
So I'm going to ask them that. It's an idea. The one great uh, quotation about if you think you can do something came from Henry Ford. He said, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> I like that. Um, oh, no, space. Let me tell you about space. After years of thought and research, I have come to understand how space remembers. And Rupert Sheldrake had an idea that is very important. It was unanimously rejected by the scientific community. He got all kinds of grief. The editors of Nature magazine said that his book was a candidate for burning. What a horrible thing to say about a guy's life work. Burn it. Wait, they really got mad. One, one guy went up on stage while he was giving a lecture and stabbed him. Oh. Got so incensed with Rupert Sheldrake. Sheldrake wrote a book about 10 things that everybody accepts as being the truth that we need to look at again. Um, he, he, he didn't, he wasn't nasty or anything like that. He just said, we have to think about these things. These are the things that everybody knows is true. For example, this is where my mind is. This is where I think. This is where consciousness is. This is where my memories are. Maybe that's not the whole story. And I think he's right. In fact, there are about a dozen prominent scientists who think that mind is not in the head. I gave a three-day seminar on Malta on that very subject a couple of years ago. So I've looked into this very carefully. Um, Sheldrake said, the mind is, if you compare the, the memory with your TV set. You can't take the TV apart and find last night's programs. They're not in there. Memory and mind is not in here. The, the brain is like a TV. It tunes in to things that are somewhere else. And where is that somewhere else? Is this shocking to you, the idea that you're, you don't mind? And there's a big problem for neuroscience, which is that some people don't have a brain. And they function perfectly normally. They are hydrocephalic people. M many hydrocephalic uh, people are severely impaired. Some, if you do a, an MRI of their head, there's no brain in there. And they get along fine. They play the piano. They're graduate students. They are socially competent. They're normal people without a brain. What is happening there? What is going on? That's a big problem for neuroscience. <laughs> what I have put together and what I'm talking about in my various seminars this year is the quantum information field. And it appears that there is an information field that extends throughout our bodies and throughout space to the distant stars and galaxies. It's a continuous system and it remembers. And to understand it, one of the ideas is that black holes, the rims of black holes, are great cosmic hard drives. They remember, they store information. Well, they're billions of light years away. That's crazy. How could my thought, my word, my what I do here today, how could it get out to a black hole? billions of light years away. Well, it turns out 
that when Einstein said nothing can go faster than the speed of light, he was wrong. And one of the people who demonstrated this substantially was a Russian scientist named Kozarev. And I actually met his son who talked about this. Kozarev was one of the world's, he turned out to be one of the, probably the leading astrophysicist in Russia. We don't know much about him because American science doesn't check in to what the Russians do. Kozarev, Stalin did not like the scientists. He was afraid that they would create problems. So he put them in the gulag. He locked them all up. And Kozarev was locked up in the gulag. And they would bring him a book every now and then. Most of the books they brought him were about Soviet propaganda. Mm -hmm. If he showed any interest in the book, they'd take it away. <laughs> By some miracle, they brought him a book on astrophysics, which he pretended to not be interested in. When nobody was looking, he devoured the book, he memorized it, he thought about it, thought about it. And by the time he got out of the gulag, he was ready to do some experiments. And he did experiments showing that light can travel very much faster. There are signals that can go very much faster than light, 10 to the ninth times faster than light. That's really fast. That's fast enough for my snap of the fingers to be recorded on the rim of a black hole billions of miles away. It's virtually everything in the universe is instantaneously connected. No delay, no delay. Um, Solzhenitsyn heard this story and he wrote it up in his famous book, The Gulag Archipelago. I got the book. I looked it up. The story of, of Kozarev is in the book. I check out. When somebody says something is somewhere, I check it out because there's a lot of things that people say are somewhere and they're not there. So I checked it out. It looks like there are four major things that space is well known to do. One is space is a hologram. Our bodies are holograms. For example, you can read what's going on with all the organs by looking at the ear. There's a map called a homunculus. There's a map of the body. Your liver is here and your kidneys are there and so on. And acupuncturists put needles into those specific points in the ear to treat particular organs. That's one example. There's iridology, iridology. The iridologist looks at your iris and sees the patterns of colors and can tell what's going on with your health. Um, there's reflexology. There's a map of the body on your hand and on the bottom of your foot. You can treat the liver by pushing on particular points. Reflexology works. These are uh, the first one that I ran into was I studied Rolfing to find out what Dr. Rolf thought about the body and her model of, and I was fascinated to find out, in fact I took a Rolfing class just to find out what they thought they were doing. Because <laughs> I was interested in their paradigm. And one of the things she said is you can tell about the whole body by looking at one joint. If you look at one joint and how it moves, you can read the whole story. That's interesting. Try it. You'll like it. <laughs> I noticed once I was watching a, a woman walk through a doorway, and she had on tennis shoes, and her ankle did this little twitch thing. That told me about her whole structure. It works. So the body is a hologram, space is a hologram. 
There are books on the holographic universe, lots of them. They're very scholarly, serious books. This is not airy-fairy baloney. This is real science. The universe is a hologram, meaning that the information of the whole thing is in every part. So the information of my snapping my fingers is here, but it's everywhere. It can be read any place. It's recursive. Recursive is an interesting phenomenon. Have you ever been in an elevator where there's a mirror on both sides of the elevator? And you look at the mirror and you see your reflection, and you see the reflection of your reflection back and forth and back and forth, and you can see yourself reproduced off into infinity. That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. That's recursive. That seems to be the way the universe is organized. The universe is tensegris, and this comes from Buckminster Fuller. And it's a very interesting, the uh, Fuller noticed that humans in their architecture use compression. They pile bricks on top of each other, stones or bricks or whatever. And he noticed that nature uses a combination of compression, and these are called struts, and tension. These are called tendons. And he built <laughs> geodesic domes and various other structures um, based on combining tension and compression. It makes a great model for the human body because the more you load it, the stronger it gets. That's a good feature. Imagine a little old lady carrying two heavy suitcases. Try to push her over. She's really very strong. The other good thing is valuable for athletes is if you bang into it, the vibrations go through the whole structure. So it's very good for absorbing shock. And if tensegrity is compromised, or tensional integrity, as it's called, like with some of the struts touching each other, these are the places that break. So when you fall down, so athletes need to have their structure integrated so that there are no sticky places. So they can be resilient. Resiliency is the ability of the structure to go back the way it was before. It's also a characteristic of space. And information can be quantized. And this gets a little technical, but it can be quantized in the direction of the struts. And um, direction is quantized. There are only so many directions. There's, there's this direction and then this direction, nothing in between. And it can be quantized in spin, the spin of the struts, which spin is quantized. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. <laughs> what has happened, in, and, and by the way, uh, Einstein's great discovery of 1915, he gave a talk at the Prussian Academy of Physics, um, was published in 1916, said to be the most beautiful scientific paper ever, in which he described how gravity works. And gravity works by altering the curvature of space. So the fabric of space is altered by gravity. And that has been the most extensively and widely agreed upon model for how gravity works. Like you may have seen, here's the sun, and here's this fabric that has a big dimple in it. Where the sun is sitting, the, the uh, model is to use a trampoline and put a weight on it and it caves in around the weight and if you roll a ball across the ball will go down into the depression and back out again light beams go are distorted in their travel they don't go in a straight line near an object they are 
They follow the curvature of space. So that is a well-accepted model and relates gravity to the fabric of space. So it's holographic, it's tensegris, it's got recursive geometry, it has <laughs> that are going on that make put together make a pretty complete explanation of how information is stored in space. Um, I got involved in I met a man in Spain who developed a device to protect people from electromagnetic fields. This is it. Um, I have a little one on the back of my phone. He invented this device purely from intuition. I like that. Scientists need to be more intuitive. They need to realize where their ideas are really coming from. Mm -hmm. they, they think, they take credit for their ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't get their ideas mm -hmm. from themselves. They get them from the intuition. So anyway, this elderly gentleman that invented this thing to protect people from electromagnetic fields, he had it tested. He formed a par partnership with a company called Pranam. They had it tested in five universities in Spain. They all had different measures of how the device worked. It works. The scientists couldn't figure out how it works. Jim, can you explain how this works? I said, sure. I didn't have any idea. But I had faith in my own intuition, and I knew if I looked at it and studied it and thought about it long enough, I'd be able to find out. And I finally did. And what I found was, I, this has a pattern on it. It's kind of like this. It's called the flower of life. Mm. I had never heard of the flower of life. I'd lived a sheltered existence as a <laughs> scientist. I, I, didn't, I didn't know about the flower of life. And I started to read about it, and I found that all the great minds down through the ages had studied sacred geometry, the flower of life, phi, the golden ratio used in architecture, this symbol is found on ancient temples all over the world. The ancients knew something special about this. What is it? Well, what it is, I finally figured out, is that it regulates how the fields enter the body. And what this device does is it converts energy in the environment, like from a cell tower, into signals that are good <coughs> for you, that build up your energy field. That's pretty clever. So that's what this does. And that brings me back to the, the fourth really interesting thing about space that I kind of spaced out <laughs> there for a minute. Um, scientists, a group of 10, very sophisticated quantum physicists spent years studying the fabric of space. They did an experiment. They made uh, <coughs> strings of niobium atoms. They're magnetic atoms. One atom thick string, and they plucked it. The frequencies <coughs> were the frequencies of the golden mean. The fabric of space, the quantum fabric of the universe is, its mathematics is the same mathematics as this, the golden mean, the same mathematics as this. I, I had a friend who did muscle testing. I'm stronger when I wear this shirt than without it. I have one that's black and white. 
I don't get as strong, and the color is important. The black and white one makes me stronger, but the, the color is even better. So that's, that's the final piece to this puzzle, is that we know the mathematics of the quantum information field. It's five. Um, one other thing that happened, I started looking at things that scientists don't look at because they're too weird. Um, I started watching this medium. He's called the Hollywood medium. <laughs> Tyler something. Have you seen that? It's a fascinating program. And this guy contacts people who have died. And he's very sensitive. He's a young guy, he's like 21 years old. They give him the address of somebody in Hollywood. He goes and knocks at the door. A famous movie star opens the door. He doesn't know about the movie stars. He's interested in being a medium. He doesn't watch the movies. He doesn't know anything about who these people are. They're people you would recognize from TV programs or movies. And he goes in, says hello, sits down, and he asks them to give him something like a watch or some object from the person who died. And he starts to scribble on a piece of paper. And then he starts talking about that person. And there was a dog, there was a white dog named Charlie. And the person goes, he couldn't have known that. He, he picks up information from the information field. Now, the classical thinkers say it's all fake. It's not fake. If you watch it, you can see he's not faking it. He's really doing it. What's really interesting is he wrote a book, Between Two Worlds or something like that. It's, he describes how he got into doing this and discovering he had this gift of tuning in to people's past and their dead relations, dead relatives. Sometimes it's very emotional for these people. He says, your father is fine where he is, and he forgives you for not being there when, you, when he died. Mm -hmm. Or some emotional thing that, that was really important to the person. They felt, felt guilty for years because they weren't there when their father died. And the message is, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And he's very sweet about how he <laughs> handles these very emotional things. And what's interesting, really fascinating to me, is on the back of his book, the back cover of the book, there's a picture of him standing there, and he has around him, he has this. He knows. That's my story for today. <laughs>